Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and this episode is all about shooting high ISO photography. As soon as I mention something usually about raising your ISO above 100, there tends to be some anxiety that well, I'm going to get grain, I'm going to get some noise, I'm not going to get as good a quality, but you might be surprised. In fact, we're going to run through two tests, I'm going to show you how to do it with your camera and it's probably going to blow your mind on some of these results. Then I want to talk about what what's going on so we can understand how far you might be able to push your camera and also for the various conditions that you might be shooting under and then also when something goes wrong how to kind of recover from it. But the first thing is you need to be able to test your camera for something known as ISO invariance and it is super simple to do. We're going to take three shots together here. I'm going to show you what I did here and suggest some settings to do this on your end. A couple things here real quick before we run the tests when you set this up you want to put your camera on a tripod. We want to have a consistent picture between one test to the next. So it has to be the exact same focus, the exact same look. Also, we want to keep our uh, white balance exactly the same. So if you're shooting outdoors, which I'll do for the examples I'll do in my test that I did here, then we'd be shooting about 5,000 Kelvin. Keep it at the same uh, white balance. If you're doing something inside, don't use auto white balance. Just use something that looks pretty close. Also, to keep things consistent, you want to turn off any vibration reduction that you have on your lens and that way we can get once again something very consistent vibration reduction can cause sometimes a little bit of shimmy and shake. So we're going to get something very tack sharp, we're going to get something very consistent and prove to you that you can raise your ISO value quite high and not really see noise and grain but you might see something else happen and I'm going to explain what that is. Now as you know when I'm shooting interior real estate state photography. I talk about this through all the videos, through all my books. It's ISO 320 is my magic sweet spot and people are going, why would you use something so high? And when I'm shooting outside a lot of times, I'm at ISO 200. Why am I not going down to 100? Well, I'm going to show you some of those reasons as we get through these tests. So let's get ready to take the first test. So for our first test, we're going to take two pictures, but we're going to take all the footage right now for the second test as well. There will actually be three pictures in total. What I've done here, I'm just showing this in uh, Nikon software, the OEM software, Capture NXD. You can use Lightroom to view these if you want, but if you know, as I talk about in my other books and videos, is that this will be the most accurate method to see what's going on if you use your OEM software. If you're using Canon, it's DPP. If you're using a uh, Nikon, it's like Capture NXD. If you're using a uh, Sony, you can use Capture One, but if all else fails. You can just use Lightroom for this. It will be fine. This will be the most accurate. So anyways, once again, starting our test, make sure your camera is on a tripod. Make sure that you have vibration reduction turned off and you have your white balance set to a fixed Kelvin value. So here, what we're going to do is we're also going to keep our aperture at a fixed aperture and we're only going to be varying our shutter, our shutter speed and our ISO value. So this was just a little section of my little tiny backyard and it was a very simple test here. This first shot was done at f11 and I'm going to keep f11 throughout all of this and then I set the uh, the, uh, once again, the white balance of 5000 Kelvin. The shutter speed is 1 1 25th of a second and the ISO is 100. Click, take the picture and we can take a look and when we get real close, that looks pretty good. So this hasn't been sharpened. There has been no adjustments that have been made in post to do anything. You can see there's a little bit of blur from some bug going by because I'm only shooting at 1 1 25th of a second. I can even see a little bit of sensor dust here. Sorry about that. But anyway, so we can see it's a pretty good picture. Color quality is okay. Okay. and for being a raw file it's pretty sharp and by the way you need to do this with raw files to conduct this test you should be shooting in raw anyways but anyways to conduct this test very important okay now let's take our second shot remember where we are right now we're keeping it at f11 we're keeping our white balance the exact same in this case was 5000 Kelvin we've been shooting this shot at 1 1 25th of a second ISO 100 now we want to increase our shutter speed and our ISO to match it. We want to do this by five 
stops. Now, what you can do to make that easy on yourself is most thumb wheels on cameras, most of them have one or two thumb wheels, then those are used in to adjust your shutter speed and your ISO, and they're done in one third stop increments. So three clicks on one of your thumb wheels is going to be a full stop. Going from five stops in this case, in both shutter and ISO, would be this shot. And this shot is at one four thousandths of a second, ISO 3200. So that gained me five stops, the exact same. We go back and forth, and of course this is just zoomed out, but you can see there's very little difference as far as the exposure. I'll get to more of that in just a second. But now let's zoom in 100% at this high ISO shot. ISO 3200, there is hardly any grain. It's imperceptible. If we go back then and compare it to the ISO 100 shot, there might be just a little bit less grain here on the ISO 100 shot. We look up at the sky, but when we take a look at the higher ISO one, there really isn't any noticeable grain, nothing that would really hurt. And this, by the way, was done with an older camera. This was done with a Nikon D610. But there is a difference here. Let's take a look real quick at the histogram up here. Now, one thing I like about this software is I'm gonna be able to undock this. We can take a big look here at the histogram. So this is our high ISO shot, and this is our low ISO shot. So this was ISO 100, and this was ISO 3200. And there's a difference that you can tell. Let's take a look at these red and green peaks. Here in the low ISO shot, the peaks are high and narrow. When we go to the high ISO shot, the peaks are shorter and they're wider. So what's happening here is that even though we really aren't getting grain, when we go back and forth between these two, we can see that the contrast has changed. So the dynamic range is actually what's being affected. So this is an important thing. When the dynamic range is affected, then we'll lose contrast. Let's dock this and take a closer look now. Let's go into our low ISO shot. At 100% even without any sharpening, we can see these leaves around, for instance, this, uh, this grapevine that I've got back here. They look fairly sharp, pretty crisp for not even doing any sharpening. When we go to the high ISO shot, that's when those edges start getting a little bit on the soft side. It's acceptable sharpness, and I could sharpen it more in post-processing, but it is now becoming soft because we're now suffering from a compression of dynamic range. So now though, let's go on and catch the footage for our next test and what we'll be doing with that. And I'll talk about that more in depth also first after talking a little bit more about this dynamic range issue and what to do about it. So what we've done here on our second shot that we've taken, we were using one four thousandths of a second at ISO 3200. Now, keep that shutter speed just as high but now lower just the ISO by five stops. We're gonna lower the ISO to 100 and we're gonna get a pretty much all black image. So we lost that five stops of ISO by keeping the five stops high on the shutter. So once again, we're still keeping it at F11 and we're using one four thousandths of a second, ISO 100, pretty dark. But now let's up the exposure in post. And once again, you could use Lightroom to do this. I'm using the uh, tools here in Capture NXT and I'm gonna up that exposure by five. And when I do that, the image comes back instantly. So this is the shot using the high ISO and the high shutter speed. This is using the high shutter speed and low ISO. And look at that, it recovered it. If I go back here to where I didn't have that up to five stops of exposure, this is how the shot looked. This is what hit the sensor of the camera, or at least we thought it did. And then when we increase that by five stops, this is what we get. Once again, though, something else is going on. Now let's look a little closer. Let's zoom in 100%. And here is where we start noticing more grain being introduced into the picture. We can also see some difference in the histogram also. This once again is our high shutter speed, uh, low ISO. This is the one that we increased our ISO or our relative uh, exposure in post. 
and this is how it was when we were trying to do it naturally. And of course, then this is the best quality that we can get. So along the way, we can see that the dynamic range itself keeps getting compressed. Every stop along the way, those peaks get shorter and the peaks get wider. So we are losing dynamic range along the way. But we need to talk about real quick though, why this is happening and what that noise is. And that way you know what's going to happen and how to expose properly for it. And then also things you can do about it. And also what cameras are taking some of this into account nowadays. If that surprised you, you're not alone. It's something that a lot of people don't realize because we're taught as photographers that high ISO means noise, grain, you're gonna get that, but things are different now. So understanding what's going on here will help you then take better pictures for different circumstances. So I wanna explain some of this more in depth what's going on. Very simply put, in the film days, the high ISO was a type of film, chemical, chemical composition manufacturing of that film would then make it more light sensitive and it came at a cost of introducing grain and high noise. But nowadays we're using sensors, so we've got a digital sensor. So that sensor is picking up light that is hitting it and then that turns it into an electronic signal that the camera then can process. So, so far so good, you probably already know that. But when you increase the ISO on your camera, what you're doing is you're like increasing the volume, you're increasing the gain, you're increasing or amplifying the signal that hits the sensor. So that way the sensor in effect becomes more light sensitive. It actually isn't more light sensitive, it's actually the signal that's being amplified. So you can think about it this way. I like to uh, liken this to audio. So if you turn up the audio on your TV or stereo or something, and it goes louder, 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 and you're not really hearing any noise, you're not hearing anything that's staticky. Turn it up too far and it's gonna become distorted. Also, if you turn your volume really high on your stereo or whatnot, and you have no noise, you might hear some background static. That is noise that's being picked up. So all electronics emit some type of noise. So all the electronics going on in the camera, things around you all the time, there's little bits of signal. So how well a sensor is made, how well its electronics are shielded from noise, will then determine how high you can turn the gain on that camera sensor, how high you can turn that ISO up and still not then have much noise. So this is something that's referred to nowadays as ISO invariance. Can you vary the ISO value and it wouldn't matter? Well, there's really no such thing as being 100% ISO invariant, but you can get to a certain level to understand where that would be. Now, the dynamic range issue. So we saw that increasing the ISO from 100 to 3200 didn't really have any effect on noise or grain. Two things going on there though, we did see a faltering of dynamic range because when you turn the signal up, when you turn the gain up, you're gonna lose some of the quality of the signal itself. It doesn't mean that noise would necessarily be introduced, but the dynamic range, the amount of light, the, the gradients of light from one thing to the next will then start to falter. So with that, you start losing contrast Contrast, contrast then loses sharpness. Sharpness, sharpness is a factor of finding usually edge detection from one contrasty area to another, not just in light, but also in color. But in those areas of lightness to darkness, that's where then sharpening algorithms come in to make something sharp. The other thing that we can see is that we might start losing some color quality out of that. Color is more than just red, green, blue. Color also has luminance. That's why you see sliders in Lightroom and Camera Raw and whatnot, they'll call it HSL. You got hue, saturation, and luminance. So luminance is part of your color variables. So you have to, if you have a low amount of light, then you're gonna have a lower amount of luminance. There, you're gonna start having some faltering. Now, the other issue that we came across is when we went to our second test and we increased the gain outside 
of the camera. We did it in post-processing software. Herein lies a problem. So yes, you can increase your ISO later. You can increase your exposure, I should say, later in post-processing, but how far can you push it? Well, the more shadowy area that you have, the darker that it is, the less information was then recorded by the sensor. So it was whispering very softly because it had all those shadows coming in. If you were to liken this once again to an audio signal. So those whispers are going to be very much, very little above the noise. So they're going to be hard to discern against this just natural noise that would exist in and around the camera sensor that's recording this information. So once you turn that up outside of the camera, the camera no longer knows how to deal with its noise and you're going to then introduce this type of grain and whatnot in there. It's also going to compress your uh, dynamic range. The other thing though with that is that we have to remember that if we were to let the camera take care of that, it has smart algorithms built into it. That's what test number one did. The smart algorithms knew I have enough signal here that to avoid any noise, I know how to deal with that here and there. So what do you do to avoid it? Very simple. One of the biggest things is to expose to the right. It's called ETTR, exposed to the right. And I talk about this throughout my books. I talk about it in other videos. And by the way, I know I've mentioned this a few times. I've got a link to my books on real estate photography down in the description for this video if you'd like to check some of those out. But especially like in the interiors book and my lighting guide, there I show histograms and how exposing to the right most of the time will get you what you want. You want fewer shadows because shadows have lower signal. Lower signal can then be susceptible to noise within the camera. It's not noise because the ISO is low. It's noise because there's just natural noise around there. And if you turn up your gain too high, you turn the ISO too high, then of course you can introduce something else in there as well. So exposing to the right will help that quite quite a bit. The other thing too is something known as dual ISO. This is where, once again, cameras can make sometimes better decisions on this than software can. Let's take a real close look here, for instance, on the camera that I was using that was really old compared to a newer camera of the Nikon Z6. A great place to look for this is at dxomark.com. And here I'm able to compare two cameras, that old Nikon D610 versus the Nikon Z6. So we can see in orange, that's the Nikon D610. In red is the Nikon Z6. And the Z6 actually falters on dynamic range up until it gets past 400. Then all of a sudden it takes a jump and then it gets better on the dynamic range throughout the high ISOs compared to the D610. A lot of times this is called dual ISO or dual ISO gain. And all that this is, this is where then the camera knows the type of gain it should apply to the incoming signal off the sensor. In other words, when a certain ISO value is set, what type of gain will it use? What will it use in its electronics? And what will it use in its algorithms to then deal with this? That's why a lot of cameras nowadays, a lot of these mirrorless cameras, especially nothing to do with mirrorless, just because the tech is newer, is that they're able to come up with these better type of ISO D dealing compensation type of electronics and algorithms. Everything else stayed the same. In fact, let's go over to noise. We can see that the noise actually was pretty much the same. It was a little bit better on the Nikon Z6 than the D610. Tonal range, yeah, once again, not much of a difference. Color sensitivity, that eh, did vary somewhat, and I'd kind of expect that for the, a newer mirrorless camera to be a little bit more color sensitive. But what's really telling is when we look at that dynamic range, and we can see that the dual ISO comes into play. So some of the advantages might be obvious to shoot high ISO stuff. Uh, for instance, doing videos, you know, and I talk about this in the uh, my videography book for real estate, is that you want to be able to shoot high ISOs so that you can sh be able to shoot video inside not using lights because also it's handheld. There, there's a lot of reasons for it. Also, if you're doing sports photography or if you're like me and you're, you're a grandfather and you're shooting children or a parent, you're shooting children or pets, you know 
know you got to use a fast shutter speed. So if you want a fast shutter speed and um, you do want some good depth of field out of this, something besides f1.8, which you'll get the, just the eye, you know, in focus, then you want to increase the ISO. But there's a fear of doing that. Oh my gosh, I'm at ISO 500. What's that going to do? Well, look what I just did at ISO 3200 right? On an old camera, you can do it. Don't fear the ISO. Feel free to push it, but make sure you test it first. But let's say that no matter what happened, eh, something went wrong. You did have to push your exposure later, or you had to shoot at an extremely high ISO, and now you got noise. How do you deal with it? There's some simple ways to do this in Lightroom. And of course, you've seen the sliders to do this, but I want to share with you the technique that I prefer the most to make sure that you can gain back contrast and that you can also then deal with noise while you're maintaining sharpness with what could have been a limited dynamic range. Let's take these into Photoshop and I'll use Adobe Camera Raw, which basically is the same thing as Lightroom. That way you can see how you do it in either one of these applications. So what I've done here is I've loaded up all three of our images. The first one down here at the bottom is what we would expect. So this was our shot done at ISO 100. And of course we can see very, very nice and clear when we go in 100% to the one where we went up to ISO 3200 using one four thousandths of a second. And that's where things were starting to falter. So what we do to fix that. A little get rid of some of that noise, there's just a little bit, but the biggest thing is we lost sharpness. So what do we do to bring back some of that softness? It's a little bit too soft. We want to bring back some of that sharpness. So let's load that into a camera raw filter. So you go up here to filter, we'll go to camera raw filter, or once again, you would open this with Lightroom. So in Camera Raw Filter or Lightroom, one of the first things that I would do is I would zoom in 100%. So we'll zoom in here, get in 100%, and let's take a look then at the noise and how we can deal with that. That will be under our detail. And right now you can see there's been no sharpening applied to this. If we use some of the noise reduction to increase that, we'll get rid of some of that grain. Of course, we're gonna make it a little bit softer. So what we want to do is probably over sharpen by using masking in this section. So let's up the sharpening really high. There we go. Nice and sharp. Look at that. We're up at about, let's get it even up higher. Let's say about 75. Wow, this, that's super sharp. Once again, it's detecting edges. We can move around here. If you hold the space bar down, you'll get the hand. So I'm doing that. So you can see I'm, here's my little eyeglass, but I hold the, the hand down there. So with using space bar. So that's good. So I did get rid of a bunch of noise. I added the sharpening, but I don't want to sharpen the soft areas of the sky. So holding down your Alt key, I'm on Windows, so it's Alt, and then sliding the masking slider over, slide that over until those areas of like the sky where you want it soft, they disappear. So all we're after here is pure edge detection. So what we're able to do here, you can see the mask is really high. The sharpening though is really high as well. But we were able to get rid of a lot of that noise that was starting to show up. It wasn't that bad at 3200, just a little bit, but we were able to get rid of that. So let's just say, okay. And that's then how that would look. So if we go in then 100% on this, and we just go through our history here. We can see this is now nice and sharp. If we go to what it was before, we can see some softness with the ever so slight detection of some grain, but this is then one way to sharpen it by one, reducing the noise, using a lot of sharpening, but then with masking so that we're not sharpening those areas we want to maintain soft. We only want the very close edge detection. Now, let's go here to the worst case scenario, which was test number two. And in test number two here at 100%, we see all kinds of grain up here. So we got to do a lot of futz, and this is where it really gets tricky. So once again, let's load this into filter, camera, raw, filter. So we're going to do something similar here, and we're going to see how far we can push this. So now we can see that if we go in 100%, move it around, we can see all that grain, just all kinds of nastiness started to come up if you're pixel peeping. But once again, if you printed this, you might not see any of that, unless you just started getting up to blowing this up by about two feet wide or something. So small pictures, it wouldn't even have to, have to deal with it. So we'll go up here to our detail section and let's see how much noise we can get rid of. Let's move that up slowly. Hey, a lot of that noise started going away right at about 26. It's not bad getting rid of that. Let's even push it further so we can really get rid of as much noise. Now it's getting super soft. So once again, we have to add a lot of sharpening back into it. 
And once again, we're seeing the noise come back. So we're at sharpening, we'll turn that down just a little bit. Once again, usually about 75 is a good number. We'll leave it there, 77. And then for the masking, hold the Alt key down, bring that mask over, and we want very little to show up. So we're gonna probably move this masking up even higher so it's just the very edges. Now we've got something that's starting to look really sharp without any noise. So let's take a look at a little bit of before after. We'll click OK and we'll just go through the history. So this is after we applied that. And if we take a look then right before, we can see there was grain, kind of a loss of sharpness, just kind of soft overall. But once applying those settings then, things got rather sharp. So once again, the key take home point is get rid of noise first and then sharpen really high. But when you are sharpening, use a lot of masking and it is so easy to do that in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Knowing how far you can push your ISO gives you a wide variety of flexibility for every genre of photography that you may want to shoot. For various circumstances to know how you can freeze time a little better, avoid motion blur, and what really will result from that if you do push your ISO really high. If you're exposing properly, you probably have nothing to worry about. Worst case scenario, there are things you can do in post-processing. If you underexposed an image by one or two stops, you can easily up that exposure in today's modern cameras and really not lose any quality. Yeah, you'll clip a little bit of the dynamic range, you might get a little noise, but until you get into the very, very high ISO ranges, those things are negligible and easily repaired in post-processing. So run the test yourself on your camera and you may be surprised. And then of course, start experimenting with what you can do to push your ISO and get very creative on the type of imagery that you can capture. Anyways, I hope this video was useful for you and that you can use some of this in your photography as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.